So, and now we're back here from Javaland with the night hacking interview section. And we have a new guest, so welcome Oliver Gierke. Please introduce yourself and what you want to talk about today. Uh, hi, I'm Oliver Gierke. Um, does that work? Yeah. Uh, probably. Uh, I'm working for the Spring team in, at Pivotal, um, mostly responsible for uh, Spring Data as um, an engineering project. Um, alongside like five other colleagues, uh, we're working on data access APIs there based on Spring. Um, and I've been here at Javaland for a talk on domain-driven design and REST, because that's like two different topics that uh, have like followed me along, or I or I have followed along uh -huh. for quite some time. And um, the connection between the two, actually, um, and especially how uh, following domain-driven design principles uh, makes it easier to build like RESTful web services, high-level RESTful web services, or the other way around, the lack of following DDD uh, mm -hmm. can cause problems. And um, yeah, combining the two, actually. Yeah. OK. So for the audience out there who's not that familiar with the domain-driven design uh, principle, because yeah. I think that's probably something more new, um, how could you p just quickly describe wh wh what is where doesn't it really fit together with, with REST? Or wh what's the other well, like the difference? A, I mean, the... the the, the the gap that you have to bridge here is that um, like on the on the domain driven design is all about uh, making things explicit in your domain model right yes. having explicit operations on your entities your aggregates all these kinds of concepts that domain driven design introduces and then uh, along comes rest which is a like a um, architectural style in the first place but within HTTP it bec became a remoting protocol basically and now you're based you're that that uh, rest comes with a lot of constraints right so you're basically limiting yourself to some very technical things like uh, a well-defined set of methods that you can use to interact with resources or the concept of resources so there's a the question is like how do you actually bridge these the the desire to make uh, business things very explicit and very domain driven mm -hmm. very domain specific with the fact that you sort of have to constrain yourself to certain architectural means that you have uh, in the REST world. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a couple of things that uh, you, you, you can follow and uh, that will make it easier um, if, if you try that. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's sort of it, actually. So it's kind of mm -hmm. this kind of, kind of gap between, between the two is, is the interesting bit, I guess. OK, cool. So um, yeah, wha what do you have for on a slide? So just quickly um, introduce how you could bring these two concepts together. Yeah, I mean, th that's actually, that's an ex it's an excerpt of the talk I gave like yesterday. Uh -huh. And it's uh, from the latter part of the talk. So I already discussed uh, concepts like entities and aggregates already. Mm -hmm. And the thing I'm trying to get to here is uh, the aspect of hypermedia, which is a very important one of REST. Um, yes. And how that actually uh, can help you to uh, express certain things in a REST API that you have like previously implemented in, let's say, uh, your domain model on the server uh -huh. side. So what I have here is uh, a kind of a state chart of um, an example project that's actually taken from the book REST in Practice with, um, from, what is it, um, Ian, Jim Weber, Ian Robinson, and mm -hmm. Savas Parastadidis. I usually butchered this guy's name. <laughs> But it's basically a, a shopping experience of, of like ordering drinks, Starbucks-like. That's why uh, box, where the yes. name comes from. And the interesting aspect here is that you have a high-level business process that you try to model as REST service, mm -hmm. and that comes from or that expresses itself in in the fact that you have like certain states that you try yes. to move between. And the important aspect that I'm trying to get to here is that certain state transitions, like canceling an order, mm -hmm. is only an out in in, in, a cer in certain states, yes. right? So if you, and the question comes up, how do you model this as a REST web service? Because if you like use the usual suspects of tools, then you get to some kind of documentation or specification that looks something like this, right? That's very URI-centric usually. Um, and it sort of neglects the fact that you have these kind of um, state constraints, right? You can only mm -hmm. do something if something is in, in a different state. Right. And the question that actually comes up with, or that comes up here is that, um, how does the client actually know when it's allowed to do uh, or to cancel that order, right? And there's two options to it. And fir the first option is actually the option that m most uh, developers usually use. Uh, and it's expecting the pa inspecting the payload, right? So you, you get some kind of JSON that looks like this. And you basically have documented that you can only issue the cancellation right. 
if uh, the order is in the status payment expected and you have like let's say you have your enum on the server side that has these different statuses uh, and one of them is payment expected that's expressed in that string here um, and the client's only option actually if you document your API like this right. is to inspect the payload right uh and to duplicate the business logic basically to the client side. Exactly. That's and that's actually a problem really because you you sort of replicate the rule right. and then if you want to change that rule like just like with coming up with an arbitrary uh, requirement here uh, we don't want to have payment expected in there but in German um, right. so Kasse gehen or something like that. Um, and then all of a sudden you basically screwed because if you change that then you break all ex existing clients, right? So the, the other idea, the alternative that I'm trying to present in the talk is that you'd rather want to introduce hypermedia elements to your payload and um, then actually allow the client to move to, to those and by that not couple them, uh, them themselves uh, to the, to the uh, server-side rule that much. Yeah. So you basically come from that kind of uh, specification slash documentation to a documentation that's sort of uh, centered around resource types mm -hmm. so that you can basically describe to the client saying whenever you find a link that's called cancel you can actually issue an HTTP request of delete and that will cause the, ca the order to cancel um, to be cancelled that's it so the client can now go ahead and like look for the link so it can literally implement a piece of code that says if there's a link present named cancel then I display the cancel button right Right. And that sort of allows you, or allows the server to freely change, like the the value on the that's used for the status field. Um, so the the interesting aspect here, I think, is that the coupling does not actually come from the left side of the of the data. So of course the client has to feel know that there's a status field because it wants to look up the value, mm -hmm. but the actual coupling came from the client interpreting the right side of the of the uh, yeah. key value pair, right? So. Um, we're basically trading two kinds of uh, complexities here, um, and we're simplifying the client in a way because we, we don't necessarily have to teach it what does payment expected actually mean, yep. but we only uh, tell it, okay, if there's a link present, you can do something or, or not, right? So we're, we're trading complexity, uh, protocol complexity with domain um, pro complexity, really, um, which means the client now has to know that there's things like links, exactly. uh, there's certain link relations. It, it, of course, has to know these, but it doesn't have to know about like details of what mm -hmm. what actually constitutes the fact that an order is cancelable. Yeah. Um, there is this this graphic that I usually try to show is um, if you like if you let the client ignore hypermedia elements, you have to because your s s your communication is so generic. You have to replicate the domain knowledge into the client. Mm -hmm. um, you save the amount of protocol knowledge, so there's very little of that in the client. But it actually creates a lot of coupling, as you've seen, right? Uh, and if you move more to, that's actually a spectrum here, it's not like an, a, a black and white thing, but if you move more to the right side, you actually um, reduce the amount of domain knowledge in the, in the client and have to teach it protocol knowledge, of course. It has to understand where links are, how it yes. finds these and what have you. But it actually reduces the coupling to the server in a way that it can actually get that far if you, uh, if you remember uh, that, oh, let me just go back to this thing here. Uh, if you remember that state di diagram, right? In this case, cancellation was only allowed in the payment expected state, right? And if I now write a client that just like looks for the link and then displays the cancel button, the the business expert could actually come to the conclusion that they want to say, guess what? We want to be able to cancel like all the time. Right? Yeah. We don't even like want to right. limit it to that state. So the server can just like render the link every time. Right, even in in the other states, and the client would automatically learn that it can cancel the order at, at other states in in that in that uh, state chart here. So, um, it, it in this, of course, uh, slightly uh, factored use case here, uh, we actually get to the uh, to a to a, a system that can actually learn new tricks mm -hmm. without even deploying the, the, the redeploying the client. So. Um, the, the, the fundamental idea is basically that I try that we, we try to look into to ways to build an API that can evolve, that I can do new things or I can change things in without making these changes breaking changes. Um, I wrote something uh, a bit of that or a bit more of that down in a, in a blog post that's linked here. I'm not sure we can actually add links to the interview, but uh, if you if you Google my name and evolving distributed systems, you're gonna yeah. gonna find it. Um, 
And to, if you want to play with that, if you want to see that in action, how that's actually implemented, there is a, a Spring-based implementation for that. The original book contains an implementation based on uh, JAXRS and, oh, Jesus. Um, how do I remove that? Sorry for that. Um, an implementation based on JAXRS. Mm -hmm. uh, that's working just as fine. I just used that example to uh, showcase a bit of the Spring stack as well, mm -hmm. a Spring Boot, and also a library that I sort of coined uh, called Spring Hate US, which sort of helps people to um, add hypermedia elements like links to representations. But that's also usable with JAXRS itself. Mm -hmm. So um, that's sort of it. I mean, that's the, the of course, the end of the talk is a bit of more groundwork that I usually mm -hmm. lay in the, in, the, in the talk itself. But... Um, Okay, just uh, w one last question on domain-driven design. Yeah, so, sorry for um, if you're very familiar uh, with the deeper knowledge of hypermedia, like yeah. with um, all these yeah actions and and controls, yeah. hypermedia controls, yeah. and you ask yourself if you're not familiar as a developer with DDD yet, mm -hmm. then where exactly comes DDD into play? Because it sounds like perfectly ab uh, application of hypermedia. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the thing is, uh, it's a good question, and it's actually the, the stuff that's sort of now missing from the from the complete talk, right? Yeah. The the thing, the, the the point I'm trying to make in the in the in the complete talk is that uh, DDD is like, as I said, all about making things explicit and making uh, um, like Co turning like CRUD operations, uh, like the interaction of objects in getters and setters, mm -hmm. replacing them with like actually domain or meaningful methods that yeah. represent things in the domain, and once you, once you start doing that on the server, so you make your domain model more aggregate-centric, for example, you have meaningful operations on your aggregate, mm -hmm. then the question comes up, how do I actually translate those operations into uh, REST APIs? And yeah. the hypermedia elements, the, the link called cancel, is basically just an, ex an, an expression of, of the fact this. that the, the state transition yeah. that I've implemented on the server. So that's that's sort of where, where it comes from and where things... Um, connect with each other so because if you're if you're not really thinking in aggregates mm -hmm. if you're not thinking in, in explicit operations you're probably going to build a suboptimal domain model in the first place right but um, if you're if you do that and then not take the next step to actually uh, express those state transitions those domain concepts in your API then you've sort of lost a lot of the benefits as well mm -hmm. right? That's where the, where the makes sense, yeah, comes. yeah, and this is a really good point actually, because then you say uh, then you get both the benefits of domain-driven design and right. of doing really hypermedia, right. as in hypermedia right. control, right. and yeah. both yeah fit uh, actually quite well together if you think of actually, it. Actually, yeah, that's that's yeah, that's, that's, that's a really good I've point. I've, yeah. I've seen a, I've seen a couple of like teams that tried to do domain-driven design, uh -huh. and then and actually did it, and then understood REST as basically CRUD via yeah, HTTP, exactly. and then you sort of like. <laughs> That even the even doing DDD sort of come becomes like a why do, are we actually doing that if we all we want to do is just like CRUD operations right? right but if you do DDD you basically build the groundwork to actually build more high level APIs more meaningful APIs and then express them by a hypermedia means yeah. there's a couple of like you I saw, I've seen a couple of your videos on that topic so they are well worth watching um, if you, if you want to spend more than just this, these five minutes here <laughs> on on that topic, so it's um, it's a good follow up, I think. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for pointing that. Yeah, I've recorded some uh, on the topic of hypermedia, and actually, yeah, that's exactly that talk. And yep, if you yep. apply that together with uh, DDD, that fits together really well. All right. That's true. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing this. Thanks for the invi invitation, Sebastian. Yeah, and uh, thank you, live audience, for for listening. So thank see you. you.